Let's see how this works. A little bit lower, maybe on the volume, just in case I'm about to ruin you all. Hi, everybody. I have been told to give a keynote address in the shortest time I've ever given a keynote address in my entire life, which is OK, because I'm going to tell you my life story. And that can be shortened, too, because I've heard it before. So it's time for me to tell you, if I can, some hospitality technology stories. Uh, what Mike said is true. I wasn't the first, I was the second to provide a property management system for the hospitality industry, which meant the core CRM system for hotels. So I'll give you that story as we go on, but let me kind of help you by giving you my story first, because I have a short attention span, as you can kind of tell, and therefore I need to tell it fast so that you don't forget it. But we have to start from the beginning, don't we? First of all, 61 years ago, this is almost painful to say, in 1957, I began my first business in the bedroom of my home. This is a recording studio that turned into a record manufacturing company that put me through college. This is me as a sophomore at college with a company name on the side of the station wagon. That might be embarrassing to you, but it paid the tuition. Three years out of college, I had enough money from the record company to build a building, which was something else again. The company moved to Hollywood and became one of the larger production houses for high quality records. LPs, vinyl, you guys know what vinyl is. The generation right before you didn't know what vinyl was. And in fact, 10 years ago, our little plant could have produced the entire world output of vinyl. That's not true today, of course, because of all that's come. In that time sense, back in 1971, I programmed the very first MAI Basic 4 computer, which was the very first computer with a screen, which was brand new at the time. And I taught myself to program it. I had programmed for the record company everything from MRP, which is the front office applications that teach everybody what their job will be and what's coming to their station tomorrow, all the way through back office and payroll. And I began with this with the new serial number four computer that had never been sold before. The salespeople for the hardware company couldn't find other examples of success for their hardware. So they began bringing potential customers to me at the record company to show off. And it didn't take but months before Occidental Life Insurance Company with one of the salesmen came forward and said, I'll offer you $10,000, this is 1974 dollars, that's the same as $55,000 today, to, to lease just your inventory control program, which was about 10% of what I'd written. The very same day, Normark, a food broker, came to me and said, I'll give you $10,000 to lease the little order entry portion, 55,000 US dollars today, so $110,000 for doing nothing. I knew what business I was not gonna be in, and I knew what business to get into. And so I got into programming for, first of all, Los Angeles-based businesses, 210 of them, one of which was a hotel. It was at the time the Miramar Sheridan, which was out at the very end of Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica. It became the Fairmont. But at the time, it was a Sheridan. I did the back office, $10,000, took no time at all. And then at the end of that week of installation, the owner asked, where was my front office reservation system? Well, this was 1974. In 1971, the very first front office and reservation system ever programmed and delivered was delivered to a Puerto Rico hotel by a Santa Ana company called Eco. So I came to one of those installations that by that time there were several and kind of learned by looking and then designed and printed and produced my own for that particular property. Turned out that that was a successful thing to do because Sheridan later on rolled this out to their properties of under 300 rooms. And Marriott later on, as you just heard from Mike, rolled us out for what was then to be just their courtyards. Our philosophy was we can run multiple hotels in a single computer system, which was unheard of at the time. And Marriott wanted to do that to save money for its brand new courtyards. So I licensed that for $3 million in 1982 for the software. I sold them the hardware as well, which was another 10 million, which is not bad. But I had no idea that with that one $3 million sale for what was to be 50 hotels, Marriott was to go on an acquisition and design spree to create residence inns, uh, Fairfield, Springfield, all the other chains that Marriott owns. And as you just heard, maybe not the number, 2,200 Marriott hotels still use this system today. 
Well, they've tried to replace it twice. They haven't been able to, and I love it. But, you know, it was a <laughs> single sale back in 1982 when nobody would have thought of residuals, right? It would have been nice if we had gotten either transaction revenue or maintenance revenues, but that day has come and gone. So I sold the company. In the meantime, this is uh, me flying to our offices in Long Beach Airport where we had four buildings. And uh, I flew from El Mati, for those of you that know, to Long Beach, which is a six-minute flight. Well, that's a little silly because you don't turn up a twin-engine airplane for six minutes. And so I would turn right and go to Santa Barbara or turn left and go down to Palm Springs just to get a half an hour flight out of a six-minute flight. Then I began to calculate how much it cost just to take off. Taxi and takeoff was $38 in those days, and I decided I was wasting money and sold the airplane. <laughs> this is uh, the Inc. 500, which we were twice, and then I turned 50 while running, managing this company that now had 29 offices around the world. That was the largest computer company for hotel software anywhere in the world. And my employees all over the world wore black. It was fun. As you can see, I came to work and saw that everything was black. Black streamers, black balloons, and a black cake. It was the unintended consequence of that group of people that I realized at that time, after all those years managing that company, it was time for me to move on. So, joke upon myself, perhaps, I sold the company. But I sold it at the top, and that's part of the story. And on the way home, after three years of managing the company for the buyer, I had this idea that I would invest in entrepreneurs. And I don't know where I got the idea, because nobody had coached me, and nobody invested in my company. I was a startup that self-funded all the way through, from the very beginning of the record company all the way through this. But I thought that maybe there was a business there. The term angel investor had not been invented yet. And so I called myself a resource capitalist. And I wrote a book called Better Than Money, along with Bob Kelly, a friend of mine, and tried to describe what I was doing, which was giving money to these entrepreneurs, but also four other things that I thought were valuable. Number one, I taught them how to use the corporate time, not personal time, but corporate time, which is the critical resource. Usually it's the programmers in the early companies, so that they didn't overcommit, like to too many betas or anything of the kind. Taught them how to figure out if they were in the right context at the right time, or if their business was so, be, so much before the industry that they couldn't sell anything. And you'll hear some stories about that in a minute. Taught them that they needed relationships to help them to build their company and introduced them to some of those people that I found as relationships. And finally, taught them the process, how to get from here to there, how to build the company up at a point where they wouldn't run out of money in the meantime. And all those things are interrelated, five different things, the money being only one of them. So that's the, now I've just told you the whole theme of the book and some of the subsequent books that I've read from or written from that time. In 1996, Inc. Magazine called me a super angel. It was the first time the term had ever been used which was kind of fun. So they put me in a Superman uniform, and I show it off today just to do it. So since 1993, when this all began, I have seen, it says here 8,200, but now it's more like 8,600 business plans. And uh, you're going to hear from Jeff Lappin in a few minutes, and he's seen as many as I have. And after a while, you begin to see themes. And the themes are important. Because having seen the movie before, you begin to get an idea of which ones of these businesses are going to be successful because of the idea, which one's because of the jockey, and you know that the idea is going to pivot. And you get an idea very fast by pattern matching to see what you're going to like and not like. I've invested in 173 of those with 149 second rounds. So some of these companies have gotten many more than one or two or even three rounds. Some of them were left to die. And in fact, 23 have gone public or been sold. 34 have gone the other way. And 114 are still moving, some of those the living dead. <laughs> My internal rate of return is 105% going back to 1981. Now, that's a lie, so I'll give that to you in a second. From 1993, when I began doing this professionally, it's 81% per year. If I were to take the money, and here's why the lie, when you take money off the table after having had a liquidity event, you give it to the bank to manage for you, right? So the bank manages it. What happens then, by taking and merging the management of the bank and my own, it goes down to 23% per year. And if I isolate what the bank did, me, did for me from 1993 until today, it's 5% per year. 
So there's something to this early stage investing in people like you that makes sense if we make good choices and make a good coach. So that was the lie. The lie is when you take the money off the table, the IRR stops. Okay? Six of these businesses out of all those that you saw above make 90% of all of my worth. So it's time to talk about not those businesses because we haven't got time, but some of them just to get a feeling for it. So I'm going to tell you some stories about hospitality businesses, some on myself, and then one Santa Barbara business that had nothing to do with hospitality, but because of the location, I just had to throw that one in. In 1987, one year after, American Airlines created an entity called Sabre to do one thing only, or actually two things, to make reservations for American, but the other thing was to find a way of pricing airline flights by demand. You guys remember that because you're being demand priced every day when you try and make an airline flight today. So pricing by demand meant in those days very little use of automation. They would assign a person to every route and that person would have maybe three or four routes and would look at the day's occupancy of seats on each of the flights in that route and decide in advance whether one was going to be full or not and then they would raise the price for those that were. What a simple concept, right? So this was 1986. In late 1986, Hyatt called me back to their offices and said, what do you know about this thing called yield management? We don't know, and American isn't telling us, and nobody will. And Hyatt had no idea. They were just pricing their rooms based upon three things. The list price of a room, whether or not somebody was a member of, say, the auto club or had a regular discount rate, and whether or not there was something they had to do to reduce the price just to be able to sell the rooms. That was pretty simplistic. Marriott, a month later, called me back to their offices. Remember, I had the relationship with Marriott. And they said, you know we have tier pricing because you build it into your system, which means 80% expected occupancy will raise the rate by 10%, 90% by 20%, 100% by 30%. It's pretty simplistic. So I knew there was something there. I went back to my office and began to think and wondered what I could do to do something even better than what American Airlines had done, but for hotels, because both of them are perishable enterprises. A lost seat is the same as a lost room. So I called MIT. I got hold of three LISP programmers. LISP is the language of artificial intelligence. And I said, I have a design that I would like three programmers to work on, to create for me, to create this thing that we'll call yield management, but do it with an artificial intelligence flavor that would have both deductive and inductive reasoning and could take in outside resources. American hadn't tried that. So I got the three programmers. I went to Texas Instruments, who had a machine that ran LISP. This is hard to say. And uh, I had them uh, volunteer to help us to sell this system because obviously it was good for them to sell these systems as well. So artificial intelligence, yield management, brand new thing hotels had never seen before. Airlines had just begun to make it known, or at least one airline had known to make it known. And we came out in early 1987, just in time for the annual industry trade show, which is called High Tech. We announced what we were doing. We set the room for 300 people, and 600 people showed up. We had a hit. I was so excited. We had a beta hotel in Boston, the Boston Royal Sinesta Hotel, that could prove that they would make $5,000 of extra revenue every time this machine spit out another recommendation, which was kind of wild because that was a lot of money when the machine cost $150,000. You could probably pay that back in months, I thought. Well, the general manager of that hotel was a non-believer. He was a member of the family that owned a bunch of hotels, all under the same brand name. And he said, basically, after we went through the beta test, I don't believe it. I don't believe you. I don't think you can do it. And in fact, I could do it better with a pencil and a napkin. So the management of the hotel was flabbergasted. I was shocked because we were showing a system that the industry loved and wanted to see more of. We were going through the beta test with this one hotel where the management was totally cooperative. And this owner-senior manager, general manager, said no. So I said, all right, I'll take the th machine out, but let me have something first. Give me one week. You do the thing you just said you would do. Pencil on the back of a napkin. 
and I'll do the thing I know I can do, which is run the machine, but don't connect it to the reservation system. I'll just let it run and make its recommendations, but in silence. And I'll fly back here in a week, and we'll see who wins. And he said, sure, let's do that. And I flew back in a week, and we all assembled in the conference room again. The management, anxious to see that this was going to show us the obvious winner. And so the first thing that this general manager owner said was, I didn't bother to do anything because I knew I would win anyway. And I knew right away that this was more than anybody at that time could absorb. It was just too complex. And my lesson that I learned was complexity can kill a company no matter what. I sold it twice, once to Sinesta and once to another hotel at Vistana, which now is a Sheridan. And I had to buy them both back. And so I told my chief programmer, whose name was Tom Schoenhoff, remember that name, please, because I'm going to come up with it again. I told Tom to reprogram it in the language of the reservation system and bury it within the reservation system. And we'll make it a checkoff item for $8,000. It won't have anywhere near the capability, but it will be something, and it'll at least start the industry down the path. He did, we did, and it was a hit, and our industry began to absorb yield management to the degree that we wouldn't have expected because at this point it wasn't a threat. There's your lesson. Complexity kills companies. All right, so here is the same hotel computer companies, senior management. I'm over there on the left-hand side, and these are the rest of my senior managers. Uh, and, by the way, on the right-hand side were the many, many computers that we programmed for, or programmed upon and sold for IBM, Hewlett Packard, NCR, and all the other manufacturers. And one day, one day, this advertisement appears in all of the newspapers around the country. And you can barely read it, but it is for the IBM PCAT. And for the first time, these hotel managers knew that instead of paying 100,000 to us for the hardware, they could pay 3,000 for a workstation. And they could count. Five workstations with $15,000. Why would I charge 100? How could I charge 100 when 15 was their new number? So I gathered these managers together and I said, we have a problem. And I'm not quite sure where I came up with the phrase, but I did. I said, where there's mystery, there's margin. So team, let's figure out how to find mystery in what we do. It's a lesson for all of us. It took us only an hour or two to figure out that number one, these people who were going to their local store to buy IBM PCATs couldn't network it. They had no idea how to do that. It took a third party to network it. We would become the third party and charge about 8 to 10% and get our money back partially from that. Nobody else could load our software but us by definition. So we charged another 5 to 6% for that. Nobody can configure our software, which we used to give away free. So we charged another 5% for that. You're adding these up, I hope. So our 25% net margin after discount for the hardware turned into about 20 to 21% just from mysterious things that we were able to provide in the way of software. And you know, these people were happy. And we made the same amount of money, almost, that we made when we had to handle the hardware. And the lesson is, for every one of you that has a product, early in the life of that product, what you provide is mystery. You can usually charge more for it early than you can when it becomes a commodity. Where there's mystery, there's margin. I told you I had a Santa Barbara story. Here is Andre Durand. Andre was my second investment in 1994. And he had a young business, which you have to go back a long time to understand this, was photo databases for DOS. That was brand new. Nobody could put photos in DOS back in those days. And so he had about 15 programmers in Santa Barbara. And I was his board member, Dash Coach. And we built the company and sold it for six times the amount of our investment. And everybody was happy. Andre moved to the buyer. It was for stock, by the way, not cash. Andre moved to the buyer's office in Denver, Colorado, and worked for his company, Dash Buyer, for a couple of years. And during that time, he got a little restless. And I coached him even during that time, so I kind of knew that. And he broke off from this company that he had sold after his one-year mandatory time was up. And he started in a new company. And he said, Dave, for all that you've done for me, I'd like to do something for you. We're going to create a sidecar LLC, which, is meaning, which means when we create this company for a value of $1,000, I'll build a little LLC, and I'll give you 22% of it if you'll write me a check for $30. 
So in 2002, I wrote Andre a check for $30. I copied the check, I put it in a folder, and I forgot it. And in the meantime, I keynoted one of his conferences as his company grew to 300 employees and then 600. And then in 2016, I read in the trades that Ping Identity, Andre's new company, sold for $600 million to Vista. So I called Andre. I said, Andre, remember my $30 check? He said, Dave, I was just kind of counting the days. I knew you'd be calling. It's here on my desk. Would you like to know how much your $30 is worth? $360,000. That's 12,000x. Now, that's not the most money we've ever made, but it is the best multiple I've ever seen. <laughs> so I thanked him, and the last payment just came about a week ago. So sometimes it's just an angel's luck, as it was in that case 12,000 times. Uh, we advertised purposely to be able to get the industry's attention. That is, I was preparing the company for a sale. I wanted to sell it around 1990. And I wanted to get a lot of attention from the industry to do that. I learned something. The buyer turned out to be the very hardware company that I had programmed back in 1971. <coughs> it turned out that we were reselling their hardware along with IBM, NCR, HP, and all the rest of them. But their hardware represented only 35% of our hardware sales. At the same time, as we were the largest of their retail distributors. It wasn't hard for them to realize that hardware was going away and they needed a software company. And so they were coming to the end of a quarter. They were about to announce for the first time that their revenues worldwide were going to decrease over the previous quarter. Now, I didn't know that. But they really made a run at purchasing my hotel computer company. In fact, they made such a run, they said, if we can close it by the end of March, we'll pay you X, which is a pretty good eight-figure number. And I said, sh 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 sure, <laughs> not quite knowing why, but with that kind of a number, I think anybody would have. And so we closed the deal just in time they announced it, and they integrated the two companies so that they could make the announcement. And then, as I became the president of one of their 25 companies, I began to hear the story of why they had done what they had done. And it turned out that they, meaning the board, were emotional. They knew that their stock would take such a hit that the price that their stock would reduce would be worth the company's value that they paid for me. I wouldn't have had any idea about that if I hadn't had a feeling about the emotional buyer. And so that was what I learned. There are financial buyers, there are strategic buyers, and now there's this new class, the emotional buyer. Might be the competitor you always beat because that CEO is probably unhappy. It probably means that that person would like to take you off the street in any way that he or she could. That's the emotional buyer to find. So I made a 1,000 times my money on that one. And that was the first quarter of the end of 1990, the top quarter for bookings, billings, and cash receipts ever in that industry, let alone for that company at that time. Because companies were rolling up, Marriott, who had leased my software, were maintaining it themselves. They had no other software to buy from anybody else, and that was the largest hotel chain in the world, and on and on. So that was the right time to sell, but who would have known at the time? And the lesson, again, is timing is everything in the sale of a company. So I took two of the executives from that company, and I started and financed a new firm and in hotel technology one more time. The three of us got together and said, what is it this industry can use that it doesn't know it needs? Thinking FedEx, absolutely, positively overnight, but you didn't know it until you needed it or until you had it. So we came up with something, and we called it Incel. Now, I'm going to describe it to you, and you may kind of laugh or at least smile. But back before, say, 1996, all telephones were analog, all cell phones. And you couldn't roam without paying a dollar to a dollar and a half per minute getting outside your city, your local area. So our deal was we had a hotel switch that we would sit next to the actual switch, the one that has the hotel phones in the rooms, and we would actually physically connect to it with lines, each one line for each room. And then we would have cell phones that were made for us in Korea with a special chip. And the chip was unique because 
we could first of all take anybody's call that was outbound that was using this chip and route it through the hotel and the hotel would become a telephone company using their landlines. And an incoming call would go from what would have been the room phone to the cell phone. So everybody knew they would find these phones charged and ready to go in every room. And it was the four and five star hotels that did this first, the Ritz Carlton's, the uh, Waldorf Astoria's, the uh, uh, got to think of some others, but a lot of four-star and five-star hotels. And they all thought this was a great guest amenity because people were freed from their room phones. I know this sounds silly, but we used to sit in our rooms waiting for a telephone call. Mm -hmm. There was no other way to get the call. So now you could do anything. You could roam anywhere in the city. What a great idea until another one of those pesky advertisements <laughs> showed up in every newspaper in the United States saying basically digital phones, $40 and $40 a month for a roaming plan. Well, went into that, cheap. And the roaming plan is nationwide. Who's going to use these damn phones that are sitting in the rooms? And they went fallow. Well, I had been a tiny Xerox. I wanted to lease the systems, not sell them. And so I leased all these systems. You know what that means. At the end of a three-year lease, if nobody wants them anymore, they come out. So the Waldorf Astoria would call and say, I have 800 of these things, and we're not going to touch them. You go into every room and remove them. And you take this big switch off the wall. We don't want it anymore. Remember there were three of us? Well, our garages were overflowing with phones, batteries, and switches. And there was a lesson there. And the lesson was, know the market before committing resources. Weren't there 10,000 people who knew about digital phones coming on in the two years that we built this company? Of course. Did we ask any one of them? No. Did we do any research? No, but it was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> know your market before committing resources. So the return there is, as you see it, zero, zero, which is my favorite number, not. <laughs> OK, see this letter? It's going to disappear from the screen, and it's going to disappear from the screen purposely, because I've memorized it. Tom Shonoff, the name I told you to remember. If you've seen my TEDx talk, you've already gotten the first part of this. But there's a second part. Tom left me in 1990 because he wanted to become a marketing person. And he had been the chief programmer. 26 people working for him in thousands of hotels depended upon him. And he was in the center of that storm. And he wanted to be a marketing person. And I said, you can't do that, Tom. Too much people, too many people, too much people, too much in the way of a need. So he left me in 1990. August 26th, 1995, I remember the letter. Hello again, Dave. I'm employee number seven at a Seattle-based retail internet startup called Amazon.com. He was the head of marketing for Jeff. Can you believe it? And he's, he told me exactly what he was doing and the marketing programs he was developing and how excited he was. And he said, uh, at 1 o'clock every day, Jeff and the other five and I stop, and we pack the books in the hallway for shipment at the post office. You've got to remember, this was the first two weeks of operation of Amazon. And he said, Jeff is in round two of capital seeking. I didn't know until later that his mom was round one. <laughs> round two of capital seeking. And if I had the $100,000 that Jeff wants, I would certainly do it from an intentionally uh, conservative, I think he said, individual, and uh, if you'd like me to introduce you to Jeff, I'd be happy to do it, because I know he'd take your money. Well, that was Seattle. And even though I had a plane, my whole thing, remember the coaching, the five things, was to be close enough to be on a board and to help. And it was just too far away. And so I wrote him back, and I said, gee, Tom, good to hear from you. Keep me informed. How much money do you think I left off the table at their public offering 18 months later? I want to hear a number. 100,000 would have been worth what 18 months later? Give me a number. No, oh, no, that's not 100,000, 100 million. Nah, come on. 100,000, just 18 months later, brand new little company, public offering. 500,000? A lot more. A lot more than 8 million. Keep going. Pick a number. I'll stop in a second. OK, you're close. 33 million bucks. Now you have, to, that's right, 330 times the money in 18 months. That works. Works for me. You have to hold it for six months. That's a requirement of the SEC when you 
make a private investment. So let's say I held it for a year. What would the 33 have been worth? 66, double, okay, 66 million in just another one year. And so I have a lesson out of that one. Some will get away for those of us who invest. So I missed a 660 times investment. Amazon was $1.97 back then. Wait a minute. <laughs> what is it today? So I came off the stage having given this on a keynote and given that as the last story. And two guys from the Pasadena Angels did this and said, come on over, we have our iPads open. And we see the present at the time, it was $1,000 price. And we've just calculated how much money you would have if you had held on to all of your stock. Here's that letter again. <laughs> It'll disappear again for the same reason. But today, Amazon's at $1,405.23. And that means that had I kept it all, it would have been 7, 766,000 times 100,000. Or 34980000000 dollars. OK, so if that kind of gets you, does it? It kind of gives you the reason why I can tell stories like that and smile, because you've got to smile at your success. And then you've got to laugh at your failure. There's just no other way of getting around this business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. That was, that was fantastic. We're going to call our panel, panelists up now. We're going to move our chairs. We haven't done a panel in the speaker series before, so we'll, we'll work out the kinks. And by, by kinks, I mean the microphone issues. You want to just sit there? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I think they'll all they'll all work. You know what? Pass that one down there. You guys can probably share one anyway. Oh, we can. We <laughs> share everything. <laughs> Dave, are you gonna are you gonna participate? Or? Oh, yeah. If you like, or you can sit and watch. Okay. <laughs> we'll take one chair back then. So let's. Um, so let's have you all introduce yourselves, starting with you, Chris. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Hovanessian. I am co-founder and CEO of Whistle. Whistle is a guest messaging platform. Basically, it enables hotels to engage with their guests in real time through SMS and mobile messaging applications. We're having a direct impact on guest engagement levels, customer service scores, online reviews, rankings, and employee productivity, um, all which impact the hotel's bottom line. My name is Jordan Hollander, and I'm the co-founder of Hotel Tech Report. Hotel Tech Report is a marketplace for hotel technology. So Dave may have been the first one to start hotel, tech, hotel software and hardware into these properties, but since he's kind of pioneered the market, there are thousands of players around the world, and we have 57 different categories of software within our site that are servicing hotels. So we help hotels find each of the uh, most optimal softwares for their properties and are lucky enough to work with Chris as one of our partners at Whistle. And I'm Adam Hollander, and we kind of look the same, so you probably figure that out. I'm also co-founder of Hotel Tech Report, and we are <laughs> twin brothers, no worries. Um, only thing I'd add, obviously it's pretty clear, but really simply, Hotel Tech Report is like TripAdvisor, but instead of hotel guests reviewing hotels, we have hotel owners and operators that review the technology they use. And kind of the story that Dave told was just, it doesn't, it still exists today when you went to the general manager who was a family owned business and you told him that you had a better solution, you'd even A-B test it against him and he, he agreed to it. And then by the time you got to the table, he said, actually, I changed my mind, I, I'm just better than you. That still happens today in hotel technology. Chris will tell you lots of war stories about that. We've dealt with them before and that's why we exist today. I'm Jeff Lappin and I'm happily unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> One minute. This is, to the minute. this is to the business students about my career. Didn't know what to do, went to law school. Became a hotel lawyer. Client offered me a job. He said, I'll double your salary if you come be my general counsel and I'll save a lot of money. 
threw him out two, two to the, uh, three years later. They said, Lappin, you want to be the CEO? Okay. Um, I took a company public. Um, it became Starwood Hotels, and I was the president or CEO of Starwood Hotels for years and years. Um, I left there. I do one minute because that could go on. But, but I left there. I then, through a series of, of happenstances, I became the CEO of the House of Blues, the company, the nightclub company, for a couple of years. Guy I worked at Starwood with called me up one day and said, I got this company called THQ. We're importing the, the stuffed animals from the China. We wanted to do it with me. I said, great. Within a week, he said to me, there's this company in, Jap in Japan called Nintendo, and they've got this thing called Game Boy, and go over there and see what you think. So I made a five-year license deal with Nintendo for exclusive for THQ to make Nintendo games in the U.S. Tried to merge the company with a company called Take-Two. The merger didn't happen, but I became CEO of Take-Two. We came out with a video game called Grand Theft Auto. Um, <laughs> I then left there. I moved to New York. God, one more 30 keep, seconds? Keep, keep going. Okay. I, I've never put together a resume, by the way, for all you <laughs> business students, ever in my life, until Dave asked me for one. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Um, I then got hooked up. Somebody hooked me up with somebody at Kleiner Perkins. And, and Sequoia and Inside Venture, and I did four of those venture company, very difficult situations, one of which you've heard of is Atari, um, and three others. Uh, three did well, one failed. Um, so I did all that, and then about eight years ago, I stopped, and I've invested in lots of companies like Dave has. And anybody know the Canyon Club down the street? So my partner and I own the Canyon Clubs. There's five of them around town, and I've got several businesses, but I'm happily unemployed. So that's it. Well, considering that background, keep your chin up. I'm sure you'll find a job Hi. soon. <laughs> okay, so, so Dave set the stage for us for, for entrepreneurship in hospitality. Um, you know, you think of big hotels and big infrastructure, and the last thing that comes to mind is maybe entrepreneurs. You need, you need to be a big company to compete in that space, right? So, so entrepreneurs, what is it that led you to launch a startup in the hospitality space? Chris? I'll, I guess I'll start. So um, Whistle was born out of the frustration of n not being able to communicate to the hotel the way essentially I wanted to or we wanted to. You know, the hotel only offered certain channels of communication, which was, you know, you have to walk down to the desk, wait in line, even if it's for a simple question or request, or just pick up the phone and get placed on hold, again, even if it's just for a simple request like extra towels. And so we figured that there should be a better way and you know, that's, that's exactly what we found was, was the, the need in the industry. There was a, a lack of modern messaging um, offered to the hotel guests. And so using the, the lean methodology we developed, um, what we call like early stage interviews, problem and uh, solution interviews. And then we actually found that a lot of hotels across, uh, you know, across the U.S. were experiencing the same exact issue in the sense of, you know, there's an influx of digital, uh, an influx of technology in hotels like digital key. And so guests can check in and check out of the room without ever walking up to the front desk, for example. There's a lack of this modern communication um, offered to the guests. So hotels are saying guests can come, check in, check out, and we never hear from them unless it's after the fact in a survey or, uh, God forbid, on TripAdvisor with a, a negative review. And by that time, it's already too late, the damage is done, and you know, we're never going to earn their business again. So we kind of put these ideas together and came up with our solution. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we'll get into later is how we got, you know, one of our first clients and continued to sell from there. So starting with a, a personal pain. Exactly. Something that you feel yourself. It drives me crazy. It, who's tried to call the front desk and gotten no answer? <laughs> who's been trying to check into a, who's trying to check it, who's tried to check into a hotel and waited while, while the, the desk agent's on the phone. I hate that one too. But they're just trying to keep up. But it's, it's, it's quite common to start with a personal pain. How about hotel tech report? 
Um, so yeah, I'll take this one since I kind of started and Jordan told me it was a terrible idea at first, not Hotel Tech Report, our, our initial idea, which he was right, it was a terrible idea. Um, so I worked in hotels for a number of years. Um, I worked first in operations um, through a management rotation at a hotel company based in Jackson Hole. Then I ended up moving out to the Bay Area, same company, and worked in development. So initially it was supposed to be like acquisitions, but it ended up being like a finite amount of acquisitions and focused on really just renovations. And while I was working in hotels, working with management teams as these renovations were going on, continuing to work with them, seeing their operations, seeing their frustrations, and that was out in the Bay Area, I started to get exposed to technology and people working in technology. The environment is very homogenous up there if you've ever been there. And now I look back and I don't really like that environment because it's so homogenous, but then it seemed really interesting and exciting and much more, in much, much more interesting than what I was doing in hotels. And so I started just kind of reading a lot and researching and thinking about ways that technology could be brought to hotels in ways to improve efficiencies and improve the guest experience. And so I just kind of started brainstorming ideas. Um, I had some free time on the weekends. I moved up there. I didn't really have a ton of friends. And I kind of wanted to move careers. So I was like, I'm just going to start reading and working on little side projects. And whenever I'm just at home, I'm going to work on that. So I ended up coming up with this concept for a digital concierge product, which I won't get into because, again, it was a terrible idea. Um, built it out as a website for one of the hotels in the portfolio. Uh, launched it. I literally built it on Wix, which is like a drag and drop website builder. Um, got a lot of traction in terms of user engagement. It wasn't a real business traction, but at the time I thought it was a really good idea and I could scale this to a lot of hotels if I could have one content database and basically be able to launch these city guides where I could understand what guests were doing off property and improve the guest experience. Um, and so I ended up going back to business school and decided that I was going to pursue this. Um, and so I ended up launching this company, City Key. Really, I would say in, in terms of like high level, how I got into it. I think if Chris is experiencing a pain point, Mine was more about excitement around entrepreneurship and excitement about building something, and it was about domain expertise. And I think, um, you know, as Dave brought up in his talk, I think having that, uh, that it, those connections, the industry knowledge and the awareness of what's going on in the market was definitely critical. Um, and even with that, it's still really, really hard. So it's definitely a good competitive advantage to have. Yeah, and I think kind of going back to what Chris was talking about, like our business today started from a pain point. Um, I came on while I was in a program like this at business school to help out in part time, saw how hard it was selling into the hotel market. Um, I saw vendors having a really hard time breaking through and gaining any market share, companies like Whistle amongst others. I saw vendors spending money on the same print ads that Dave showed from the 70s because they had no way how to find, they had no really understanding of where to find their customers. And so we built this because we were frustrated by an inability to scale technology into hotels because of the market structure. And so we set out to build a marketplace that would make it easy in the world of SaaS for hotel owners and operators to go online, find the right technologies, vet vendors quickly, and then bring them online and test them against other parties. And so that's how our, our business started today. Okay, so, so Jeff, you're, when you're at Starwood, how many, how many properties are you overseeing at, at at its height. When I left, there were 600, I think. So 600 so. properties. So this is a big global business. <laughs> yes. Um, when, a, when a startup approaches Starwood to service it, uh, how, how, do you, how did you view startups in the, in, in the grand scheme of what Starwood wanted to accomplish? What's really interesting is back then, Starwood, there were no startups. Yeah. They didn't approach us at all. We didn't have, there weren't any startups. We did everything ourselves. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it, but it was a huge time of innovation, as Dave said. You know, when I started, it was, there were three types of hotels, you know, the Howard Johnson's, the Holiday Inn, and the Hilton. Yeah. And that's it. And each one charged the same rate, 300, uh, not each one, but each hotel charged the same rate 365 days a year. And all of a sudden came revenue management and all kind of, and the, and the property management systems, and it was just a wonderful time. The points. You know, we started the Starwood Points thing, and it was it was just a wonderful time. And 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 I'll just, you know, in, innovation in the hospitality travel industry, you know, seems to go like this for a long time, and then it spikes, and then it seems to go like this, and then it spikes. And right now we're kind of on this spike, and there's lots of stuff going on. But the hospitality industry has historically been not very innovative. Interesting. Looking at it from longer than you guys can look at it. For. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now in that context, you guys are selling to hotels. You're selling to these big organizations where ideally you want to you get to the guy like Jeff, right? Because he's going to say, thou shalt use 
this in all the hotels. But that's not possible, and from the CEO's perspective, not desirable. So how do you how do you penetrate these these big organizations that are that are that are pretty complicated? Yeah, well, um, as the hotel tech guys mentioned, it's a very fragmented market, um, and there's many different channels there. I mean, you have now, uh, you know, Jeff, there's, everyone knows there's more than three types of hotels now. Um, and you, we also have a breakdown of different brands and boutiques and dependents and all that. So it depends who you're selling to. And at the end of the day, it comes down to it depends as the answer. But um, with larger hospitality management firms, um, I mean, typically you want to get into uh, the regional side, so the VPs will push for you, or the operations, or the VP of ops will push for you. Um, on the branded side, it's um, more of an uphill battle. Where you know, if you don't have those C-level connections, where you can, you know, call up, uh, you know, the, the the CIO or the CTO of Marriott and say, hey, I'd like to pilot this or anything like that. Um, it's more of a bottom-up approach, and you have to get the franchisees and the owners to actually fight for you and advocate for you to actually make any headway, which um, yeah, it, it's a much longer sales cycle than, than you'd imagine. So start at the bottom and sell your way up. While banging on as many doors at the top as you can. Okay. And say, hey, look what we have down here. It's working really well. You should probably, you know, Take make it look. happen across yeah, right. your entire portfolio. Right. Yeah, and I, I think as, as Chris kind of alluded to, there's an important distinction that uh, being, be, becoming a brand standard in hospitality today is actually different than when Jeff was CEO or when Dave was selling in it, as the hospitality and hotel industry has gone to an asset light model. So Starwoods and Marriott's and all these guys have sold off their properties and they're mostly moving towards franchise and management contracts, which means that owners of those properties can actually have the flexibility to buy technology. So you could actually get to the top of Starwood today and you Literally, I mean, you basically have nothing. You still have to go and sell into those organizations, which makes it really hard. And so when you sell property to property, it's a huge responsibility and a risk for someone on property to bring you on. So if you're a general manager of a hotel and Chris comes to you and says, hey, I've got the best guest messaging software on the planet, the general manager usually doesn't know anything about technology. And if they bring on a new product and it works, they're probably not gonna get a promotion. And if they bring on a new product and it doesn't work, their heads on the line. So there's a huge risk to adopting new technology from a personal and professional manner. And that's why, that's where our site comes in is we're trying to offload some of that responsibility so Chris can go to his clients and say, don't take my word for it, see what our customers say about us and make an informed decision. You could send this to the owner of your property who's usually a real estate investor or high net worth individual or a REIT and say, check out these different softwares, see what people say about it. And so we're trying to offload a lot of that responsibility and break through some of the fragmentation in the market. So you're making, you're making Chris's life a little bit easier. Yes, a little bit every day. A little bit every day? <laughs> okay, good. Um, you know, some of the, the earliest stages of a startup's life are the riskiest. We, we heard about that from Dave. So uh, I, I, I know because I, I work with Whistle, you guys are on your way. You guys are on your way. What point in in uh, in in the development of your startups did um, did the, you really know that you were onto something? Well, we're still early stage, so we never know what's going to happen. Um, but it there was there was two main main events that I can think of. Um, the first one was when I was conducting those uh, solution stage interviews. I was basically I had a scheduled call with a general manager of a of a hotel. Uh, up in Portland, which actually became you know, our first client. And I was over a webinar showing him mock-ups of our proposed solution and saying, hey, this is a problem with this solution. Basically, you know, s um, alleviate or solve these, uh, these, these issues. And at, towards the end of it, he's like, this is excellent. You know, how much does it cost? And right then and there, I, I realized that he's actually trying to purchase this software that doesn't exist. It's just images on, on, the, on the computer. Um, and so I threw out a number, he said yes, and that's what prompted me to go out and get our first <laughs> prototype MVP built. Um, so that was, that was the beginning of it. And you know, we gained a, a few clients um, thereafter, and we actually weaseled our, our way a few months later into um, the annual HFTP high tech um, trade show, which is the uh, largest hospitality technology um, trade show out there and we got into their first ever entrepreneur 20x uh, competition 
Um, that year, it was their first ever. They had partnered with Capital Factory out in Austin. Um, and so it was, I think it was all Austin-based companies. And here we are, you know, from uh, Southern California. Um, didn't have enough money for a plane ticket. Drove out there. Um, and he, we presented on the first day thinking, you know, at least maybe we'll get some recognition out of it. But we, to we took home the, you know, the, the first, first place. So, yeah, so that was uh, right then and there. We knew that, okay, we have to drop everything we're doing, focus on this, because uh, this is a tremendous opportunity within the space. Yeah, I think there's definitely been uh, quite a few moments for us. Uh, and it's, again, we're even earlier than, than the whistle guys are. Um, but I think the main thing is just uh, from an anecdotal perspective, when we started hearing executives in the industry with tons of experience, not as much as some that are here today, um, but in the hotel technology and software business say, how has this not existed before? Um, we started seeing them put our logo on, our, on their websites. We started getting checks from public companies and getting bigger and bigger checks. And we just saw that there was validation in the market that people were experiencing the same pain point that we were. Co companies that were two people all the way to 2,000 people and 20,000 people that people just didn't know where to find customers in this market. And they really believed in what we were doing. So it was really about, I think it is that moment when people, like Chris was saying, when someone puts a check on the table, that's the moment you, like, you don't know whether there's a valid concept in front of you until you start seeing that recurring revenue come in for your business and seeing that there's a real proof of concept. Yeah, I don't want to beat a dead horse on that one, but it's kind of a little bit of a different in terms of uh, you know, what, what started to really feel real. Um, for me, I always get really excited about interacting with people. I'm more on the design side and product side. Um, and right when we launched uh, Hotel Tech Report at High Tech last year in June, with, with we were basically going around to vendors, and this is where we met Chris actually. We were just telling them about Hotel Tech Report that we just launched this site. We met with every single vendor that was there, and the first companies that signed up were actually not even at High Tech. It was companies in Europe. And so the first companies to actually claim their profiles, we did no marketing, we had no paid advertising. They just heard about us from people that were talking about us. And we started to see people start claiming their profiles of companies that we didn't even know existed. And so that was sort of the first moment for me that I was like, whoa, this is really cool and people are really interested in this and started to feel like a, a real thing for us. And then obviously there's a lot more milestones along the way and getting your first check is a really nice thing as well. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyone from Austria? I, we probably do, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> we should have looked that up. Okay, so let, let's, um, let's go back to, to Hotel to the hotel industry again. Maybe Jeff, we can start with you on this one. When you're looking at, um, when you're looking at a value proposition for a hotel, there are certain class of metrics that apply just to hotels, the way that they measure whether they're doing well, that an entrepreneur is probably well served to look at. What are some of those metrics? Well, I, th I don't think they've changed over time. No, they haven't re they really. And, and I, I think, you know, Revpar, you, you hear that all the time. It's, it's a, uh, you know, you, your revenue per available room. I, I used a different metric, but it's similar. And today, uh, customer scores. Okay. And there, there's all there's all kind of white papers. Uh, 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 Intercontinental put out a white paper that you know a one one percent increase or one point increase in customer scores relates to s an X percent increase in revenue. And so I think those are the two main metrics. Um, and then, of course, cost reduction. Big trend in cost reduction, whether it's keyless entry or you know, AR, <laughs> VR at the front desk or all of that. So I think those are the three buckets that a hotel manages. It's all about bottom line. Okay. I mean, it's all about bottom line. They don't care if it's not about bottom line. And those customer scores, are they coming from private surveys that are done of, um, of, of guests, or is it looking at... TripAdvisor or both? It, it is both. It's generally the large companies have internal groups that, you know, send you yeah. how was your stay and fill out the form and all that. Okay. And, um, you know, it does translate into increased revenue. It becomes very important. Does that sound right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Customer scores, especially. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it just. I mean, depends depends on the company and what they're targeting. But for some something like our company, you know, guest service scores are a huge factor when it comes to um, showcasing our ROI. Uh, so when we have things like in-stay surveys to actually show that we're converting this unhappy guest into you know a pos positive um, experience guest, that's when you show okay, this one interaction with this guest actually 
paid for itself, uh, you know, for month over month. So okay. you know, that's that's definitely one one ma major point. Yeah, and it, it's really a hybrid. So like we actually have a category for guest feedback, which is guest surveys. But then you look at uh, products like Chris's and they're doing guest messaging. So you're like, well, if you're messaging a guest, then you should probably get feedback for them as well so you can get better reviews on TripAdvisor. But then you have another category of reputation management. So how do you listen to all of your social channels, respond to them, and understand which customers are your brand advocates? And so if you're, if you're doing that and you're trying to manage reputation, you're like, well, if I'm managing reputation, I better be getting surveys from my customers and getting guest feedback. And then there's other categories of software too that you might not even think of uh, that will come into that space. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple others right now, but there's probably five or six different categories that all do guest feedback. Oh, email marketing for one. If you're sending guest emails, you should probably send them an email that says, how was your stay? So now every time a different provider is coming to you, this is why it also gets really confusing for people, they're asking you for feedback, but it's clearly something that's really important to hoteliers and it's pretty obvious why, um, pretty analogous to kind of our business. Yeah, and kind of going back to the, the metric question, I think there's, uh, there's so like total rev par today. So if you look at the general business challenge around a hotel, it's that it's not like software, it's a fixed asset. And so there's only so much you can do. So you can raise rate, you can raise occupancy, you can lower costs. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at raising rate, you can do that by selling the hotel room for more or you can sell other services, so ancillary services like spa, restaurant, and even hotels are starting to monetize off-property experiences and market uh, experiences like ancillary tours and activities, things like that. And then the other important thing when you're talking about cost reduction is the innovation in channel management. So I'm guessing that most people in this room probably book on Expedia or Booking.com or Priceline. Um, there are commissions that are taken that are really hefty up to 25% for independent hotels. So looking at your net rev par, which is basically your revenue per, per available room minus the cost of OTA commissions. So that's a really important one as well. And actually uh, improving net rev par is one of the biggest kind of growing categories in the industry. Direct bookings is a huge priority and one of the biggest focuses in uh, within our platform and one of the biggest interest areas. So that's definitely a, a huge pain point in the industry. Okay, let's, let's shift to Let's shift to investing now. You've raised money from investors. You guys have raised money from investors. Uh, we're funded by our customers. Funded by your customers. <laughs> okay. So let's let's talk about why why the hospitality industry is attractive to investors. Jeff, from your perspective, from the from the from the investor side, entrepreneurs, from your perspective, from the well, the I, I'm both. Side. I'm in an interesting position that I'm both raising money for a fund with Dave and others called Wayfair for the hospitality industry yeah. or the travel industry. And I've also invested in numerous hotel and travel companies and in hotels. I still have pieces of several hotels. Yeah. So uh, why is it attractive to me? It's attractive today because I think there's some areas, some specific big areas in the hotel industry that <coughs> offer a lot of opportunities. I'll give you one. You know, Facebook knows everything about you, right? everything about you. I don't think there's another industry where there's the kind of data, like in the hospitality industry, where it's not used, right? Marriott should know, because I stay at Marriott's all the time, that I like this kind of room, that I eat in the restaurant for this, that I do this, that I do that, and they should target ad to me. They should know this when I come in and give me my kind of room. They don't do it. Nobody uses the big data in the hotel industry, right? And so I think that's one area. I can name five or six of them. But there's one area that, okay, somebody's going to come along and figure out a way to organize this data and make a billion dollars. You've got it? Cool. <laughs> I will talk to me after. <laughs> um, so yeah, while we haven't taken on investment ourselves, I came from that world. And I think one of the things that's really attractive for investors is that in terms of digital, like travel is one of the biggest markets in the world. It's over $440 billion in hotels alone. Um, so it's a massive market, which seems great, but it's really hard to sell into. And so that's one of the risks that comes along with that. So there's always trade-offs. And when you look at, there was a Forrester study that looked at enterprise IT spending um, across different B2B verticals. And they looked at financial services, as an example, had 8.9% of sales spent on technology. Now hospitality has 3.3%. So it's the most underinvested enterprise <coughs> sector in the world. And it's an area, it's also between now and 2021, it's projected to be the highest growth sector in the world. So I think from an investor perspective, you have severe underinvestment, 
you have Marriott still using DOS systems, which were great, but they need, they, they, they need to invest and there's only a matter of time before they need to move into the cloud and before they need to be able to iterate much more quickly. And so it's basically like the way that I see it in hotels is like this market is just, it's just, it's a tidal wave that's coming and it's only a matter of time before these hotels have to open up. Once they open up and move into the cloud, at there, there's just so much more room for innovation and as you have that growth, it's just the perfect sweet spot to be as an investor like these guys are doing. Okay. What he said. What he said. <laughs> now, uh, one thing I'd li I would like to say is from an outsider's perspective, meaning those who are not involved in the hospitality or hotel business, um, it's actually very hard to convince them of the opportunities in, in hospitality because immediately what they see is, you know, for example, like a finite number of hotels or a finite number of rooms in the industry. So in that case, it's, it's actually pretty difficult to paint the picture. But for those who are in the industry, um, like you just said, we know of the opportunities, especially since, um, you know, we have half of the half of the entire industry still running off of legacy systems or still fragmented where you know you can capitalize on things like data, for example, with all, with all the data that all these different companies are collecting. So still huge opportunities and there are actual pathways up to the top, so. I still don't understand why I can't, I can't, I can't check in until 4 p.m. <laughs> that's, that's mine. Okay, I, I, I um, I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions and then I'll, I'll, I'm going to reserve the, the last question. But, but who has questions for the panel? When it comes to the consumer, how important is Trivago to the hotel industry? You know what Trivago is. Okay. The guy with the messy shirt. Yeah, so like Trivago uh, has multiple business units, but like the online travel market, um, so like the OTAs are like Priceline and Booking, and I'm not sure, Tri is Trivago? Expedia. Oh, it's owned by Expedia? It's owned by Expedia and Jacket, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, they're, so they're basically pulling inventory from all the different online travel agents and they're comparing that inventory. Right. So there's actually been like a, even with TripAdvisor, there's been uh, some stock hits amongst those companies and they're looking at the amount of data that Expedia and Priceline and OTAs have and the reviews that they have and there's a diminishing importance. Um, but at the same time, like having ability to compare different properties is, is extremely important to the traveler. So, so I, I think it's been like the, you know, not necessarily Trivago, but online travel agents have been the biggest innovation in travel in quite some time and created a, immense value because of it. They want those industries to go away. Yeah, yeah. They're, they, they're hate, they hate those industries because if I book, if you book through. By the way, Trivago was a play by Expedia to get a piece of their competition's revenue, and I won't explain it, but that's what the play was. Um, and and but they hate those companies because if you book online at Marriott for a hundred dollar room, Marriott gets a hundred dollars. If you book that same room online through Expedia, I mean I know what they get, but call it eighty dollars. Okay, they'll get eighty dollars and then Expedia gets $20. And so they don't like those companies and they're doing everything they can to lessen the business of those companies. Hi, this is for the brothers. So um, with Light Bike, it, I originally made it for the travel industry. Um, so 900,000 Americans get blood clots every year and 300,000 die and the number one reason are long flights. Cabin pressure restricts oxygen flow. The next 48 hours, a lot of times, it's in a hotel room. If people get their blood flowing, that's the most important time. So do you ever help to promote products that are hardware but have IoT with it? Anything like that, or are you strictly, I mean, do you ever take in new health products that would enhance the health of the guests? Um, yeah, so we do, we do have hardware <laughs> products on our site. Um, we generally have a rule of thumb that it needs to be a, like a mature category so that we create an entire category around it. So an example of that would be like guest room tablets or Amazon Alexa devices in hotel rooms to order ancillary services. Um, but if there's, if there's a market there, we're certainly open to uh, having a conversation. Awesome. Any other questions? 
I have I have a platform where couples come on, they say what their favorite things are, the other person gets to look at that, and we put a lot of AI behind the a one click, you can go order it, you can plan the experience, get the tickets. And we've had ticketing companies come after us and say, we want to be on your platform. We've had two flower companies. I was at a pitch event, and two flower companies beeline towards me as soon as I stepped off the stage um, because they saw this. I can't get arrested with hotel, co like with the travel industry. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's because of this hating the OTAs. But I would think that the travel companies would be really interested in a platform where couples can, with one click, get into it. So I, for you, all of you who are experts in it, what am I missing? What am I not seeing when I go into, t like, should I be looking at companies that put together packages? Should I be going to individual hotels? What is the secret sauce? Um, so <laughs> I, I, I heard something really interesting from a general manager in San Francisco. And again, you know, it varies by market. But many hotel managers think about their hotel as a factory for business travel, and that the leisure travel actually just fills the excess capacity in, the, in their factory. And so it's really, so they think about business travelers first, and then they think about keeping their staff happy, and then they think about leisure. So when you go straight for leisure, a lot of times it's not the most top of mind for hotel managers, so it's harder to get their attention unless you have a very clear ROI for them. They're also very busy. They're they're strapped. You know, they're managing a huge team of people. These managers are getting calls at you know probably through whistle about someone you know a staff member cutting their hand with a knife in the kitchen at two in the morning. So just they're very strapped for time and attention and they're and they're exhausted. And so unless you bring something that you say I, if I'm going to give you this and it's going to help you you know get four x by tomorrow, it's really hard to break through. So I think. You know, maybe figuring out a way to partner with some of the technology businesses that are interacting that are interacting with more hotels at scale, and providing that as a feature for differentiation could be an interesting angle. I, I think the hotels will be difficult for themselves unless you have millions and millions, uh, a lot of traffic. But you may want to try the experiential companies that, that are in the business of affiliate deals. You know, that they work on you know, what is it, Clue? Get your guide. And yeah, there's all there's there's there's, a, there's 20 of them. But they yeah. work in this affiliate world. They, they want to list on as many sites as possible and share the profit. That's an easier road. And you don't even need a partnership with those guys. They right. have affiliate programs. Right. They'll, set they'll up just that you can put it on your site right and you get a little piece of their deal. And if you and if you drive enough business, you can then go with more right. deal and say, I'm already driving you this business. I'm going to go take it to your competitor unless I can get it more. Deal. That's what we're getting with the ticketing companies. Right. They're, they're just like, please get us on every, we right, want to be exactly. in everybody's. Same thing. I ran one of those. That was one of my uh, uh, VC companies. Oh. Yeah, Razor Gator. Yeah, so, but yeah, it's an affiliate world. Um, <coughs> my question is, how does uh, Airbnb change the market that you're playing in or ch potentially change the adoption of technology? Um, well, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I would say in in our experience, I mean, we definitely see a lot of a lot of hotels that are are actually not just hotels, but other adjacent verticals as a result of Airbnb and you know com um, OTAs and, and different threats running towards adopting new innovative technology. And I think that's what what um, Jeff mentioned, where we're kind of on this up curve, because uh, a lot of you know vacation management companies now, as well as hotels, want to be able to better compete with Airbnb. And I think this is part of why um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the space. So, I for one, although you know it's it's a it's a threat to hotels, I think it's it's a good thing at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, up until about like a year ago, there was actually you know a lot of early investors in Uber thought of Uber as being a hedge against car ownership. And so it wasn't necessarily trying to steal share from taxi companies, but really trying to provide an alternative mode of transportation. It was creating new use cases for driving. And so I think of Airbnb in the same way. The hotel industry has actually been stronger than ever. It didn't see much of an impact or an eating away at share um, up, in, up until recently, really recently. And it's, and it's not a huge number yet. Um, and I think the reason for that, I'll give an example. I was, when I was in business school, um, I was traveling with my girlfriend to New York and we were you know, both paying for business school, as a lot of people in here know what it's like. And uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have traveled to New York if it wasn't for Airbnb. Like, we, we wouldn't have stayed in a hotel that was 200 square feet for our vacation and paid $800 rate 
But because of Airbnb, it lowered the market entry, and so we created an entire new use case for accommodations in that market. And so beyond that, so I think Airbnb has created a heightened awareness for technology in hotels. So if you look at what you can actually do through Airbnb, uh, you can go and you can text message <laughs> with your hosts. So hotels are like, crap, we have, to be, we have to be able to text message our guests. And that works really well for Chris. We had a conversation that up until about a year ago, there was no search volume for guest messaging software for hotels. And now Chris can invest on Google because every hotel knows that if they don't do that, Airbnb is going to do it. And if they don't do it, their competitors are going to start doing it. So it really creates this heightened awareness that you need to invest. And I think it's been actually really great for the hotel industry. It's caused this like massive education around technology and the need for technology and innovation and really lit a fire under a lot of their asses, frankly. If I had CEO of Marriott here and asked him what the three biggest threats are, he would say the OTAs, the Airbnbs of the world, and he would probably say the decline in the last two generations' use of the points, okay? I, again, these are long subjects to talk about, but I'm a points junkie. I don't know what the age limit is, whether it's over 40 or over 30 or whatever, <laughs> but under whatever that age is, I'll call it 30, people don't care about points. They care about experiences and not points. That's a big challenge in the hotel, because I was a loyalist to clearly Starwood and several others because of the points. Now people don't care. Okay, those are the three concerns. So they are combating the Airbnb concern. You, if you follow M&A in the hotel industry, all of the big companies are either looking at or have purchased um, those kind of companies on a regional or local ba basis, and I think that'll continue. Okay, so last question. Um, what advice do you have to give to aspiring entrepreneurs if they're, if they're thinking about starting something in the hospitality industry? Who wants to start? I can start. Um, my advice would be to do it. <laughs> uh, go ahead and, and try it out because this is a great industry um, and there's a lot of perks like traveling, um, which you know aren't applicable to other industries necessarily. And also um, my advice would be to very early on demonstrate traction and ROI, um, not only in the sense of revenue, but the amount of market penetration um, and how far that can go, because that's very important in this industry. Um, I would say really consider the reasons why you're getting into it. I think a lot of times, and Jeff and I were talking before this about a pitch that we saw that we won't get into the details about, but there was, there's a lot of really painful pitches that go on in this industry, and I think a lot of them, a lot of them start from the, I, the fact that people say, I travel, so therefore, like, oh my God, everyone else travels, and then I should come up with an idea around this, and that's the m driving force. And I think that a lot of the times people get blinded by that. Um, so I think really think about what your motivations are and what gets you excited and what's going to get you through what inevitably will be a long and hard road. Um, thinking about that, um, whether it's the desire to create something in entrepreneurship or if it's a real business problem that you see that, as Chris pointed out, you can drive, you expect to drive real ROI quickly, um, then I think those are good motivating forces and there's a lot of them. Um, but just really n understanding and, and, think and internalizing and thinking about what you're excited about and what's going to get you through tough times when they do come. And I think that'll, that'll set you off on the right road. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I was talking to Dave earlier about his beliefs on, on education and college. And I think one of the things that people really need to do is sales. Like, get excited about sales. Get excited to talking to people about your product and, and explaining it and um, I think that's a really good thing to focus on when you're first getting started in this industry because it's really hard to sell into. Um, hopefully, Jordan and I continue to make it a lot easier, but th those would be my piece of advice. But it, it is a lot of fun, and you do meet a lot of really great people. And sorry, one more thing. Think about your customers. Um, we were selling the hotels before, um, and we really ran up into a lot of uh, roadblocks, and it was really painful, and that's what had us come up with Hotel Tech Report. And now our new customers like Chris are a ton of fun to work with, and we get really excited about grabbing drinks with them and meeting them all over the world and talking to them on the phone and thinking about who your customer is gonna be and if that's someone that you really want to invest time and, 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 and resources into, um, I think that's a really good thing to consider as well. I give you two pieces or three pieces of advice for a young entrepreneur and getting in the hotel business. Have an idea that the market needs or at least perceives they need, okay? Example, I'm sitting there with 
who's now one of my best friends, who used the head of operations at Starwood in the early days, and we said we could save a ton of money by having people not wash the towels every day. So we came up with this great environmental play, right? Save the environment, don't get, let's not get political here at all, okay? <laughs> it had nothing to do with saving the environment, okay? <laughs> the Boston Park Plaza, Starwood Hotel, is the first place that happened, and we literally saved millions of dollars throughout the system. And we were, we were applauded for helping the world, okay? Which we did, but it was not the intention. Okay? <laughs> there is a market need. Okay? And number two is, and it's really hard as a young person, I couldn't do it until much later, understand your strengths and your weaknesses and surround yourself with people <coughs> that, um, in, that, that make up for your weaknesses. Don't let your ego drive decisions. Really important and a hard lesson to learn. And on that note of sage advice, can we give our panelists and can we give our keynote speaker a round of applause? Thanks to all of you, that, that, was, that was fascinating. Um, being a liberal arts university, we'd like to give you a gift. We still believe in writing, so we're gonna give you all a leather-bound journal uh, to take notes as you're traveling the world. It's kind of like, like an iPad, it's just, it's just thicker. <laughs> okay, uh, this is the last event of the school year for us. We will be back in September. Um, we do have an IEEE event tomorrow. That who, the Mars Rover, someone from the Mars Rover project is speaking tomorrow if you want to stop by. And if you're on